What is the Zeitgeist Movement? The Zeitgeist Movement is the activist arm of the Venus Project, which constitutes the lifelong work of industrial designer and social engineer Jacques Fresco. Who's in the audience today? Please give me a little love. So I have some uh, basic questions that I wanted to get out of the way before we have the Q&A, because I think these are the most dominant questions that people tend to ask. And I wanted to talk to Jacques about his life experiences and, and what you've gone through in your life to come to the conclusions that you have in regards to your ideas. So what are the life experiences that have influenced your life, the most dominant ones? I'm trying to compress it. Sure. Now, my <laughs> grandfather uh, made it impossible for me to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. He told me that people came from all over the world and brought wonderful ideas to this country and made it what it is today. So I could not pledge allegiance to the flag. I wanted to pledge allegiance to the earth and all the people on it. teacher grabbed me by the ear right to the principal's office. And he said, she said, he doesn't want to pledge allegiance to the flag. The principal said to the teacher, you're excused. After she left, he put his arm around me and he said, why? Everybody does. I said, everybody wants to believe the earth was flat. That doesn't make it flat. So he said, uh, well, what do you think of American history? I said, it's strictly BS, bad science. <laughs> because the people in history books always did the right thing. If they always said the right thing, and there's no such people. People make mistakes, poor judgments, they would appear real. But my history books did not appear real. So, I told that to the principal, and he said, I'm going to have to call your mother in. Well, my mother comes in weeping, what did he do? The principal said he didn't do anything, but he doesn't accept our teaching methods, and he doesn't accept a lot about our government. So I'm going to buy him the kind of books he wants to read, and I'm going to rope off the back of the class and let him do what he wants to do. Well, this is very unusual. He used his own money for that, not public funds. Of course, to say, or needless to say, I was beaten up by many of the kids in the class. They didn't like this special privilege. I didn't arrange that, the principal did. I was not evil or mean to anyone, but I can understand that position of seeing one person selected to do what they want to do. This, in turn, gave me a lot of freedom to read what I want to read. And I discussed some of these ideas with the principal. That went on for a year and a half, and the principal died. And that time I played hooky for six weeks. The tune officer caught up with me, and he said, you haven't been to school for a month. I said, six weeks. <laughs> That's right. What do you do when you're not in school? I go to the library and read what I want to read. I go to the science museum and I do what I want to do. He said, what do you do at home? I said, I have a little laugh. He said, can I see it? I said, only if you don't tell my mother who you are. He agreed to that. And when he saw what I was doing in the lab, he said, look, I can't criticize what you're doing. I don't blame you for not going to school. You can do me a favor, show up Monday, and then you can play hooky again. <laughs> well, I did that, and I never went back to school. I read what I wanted to read, to read, and I did what I wanted to do. And I got information in a very different way. This is during the Depression, the last big Depression, the 29 crash, or the 1930 crash. And at that time, 15 million Americans were sleeping in every empty lot. And that bothered me because there were things in store windows 
They just didn't have the money. They bought houses and cars, and the banks failed. So they couldn't pay them off, and they were kicked out of their houses. But the sun was out, and things were in store windows. It's just that people didn't have the money. So in my own mind, I said, this shit has got to go. <laughs> signs and said, come to California. There are lots of jobs. So I hitchhiked to California. On the way, this woman comes up in a brand new car. And she opened the door part of the way. And she said, are you a Christian? I said, what else? <laughs> Get in the car. And of course, I fell asleep. I was so tired, walking and hiking. And she poked me in the ribs and said, you're not sleeping in my car. I said, what do you want me to do? She said, I want you to sing all the way to Texas. Jesus loved me, that I know, because the Bible tells me. I had to sing all the way to Texas. And so, my background was very different from the average person. And when I got to California, there were thousands of people lined up for jobs. Would you work for eight cents an hour? Would you work for seven cents an hour? They brought people out there to get the lowest bid. And it was not sane, it was not a sane society, nor were people intelligent at the time. I went to an aircraft factory and says, the Northrop Division of Douglas, and said, I'd like a job here. They said, what are your credentials? I said, I don't have any. Do you know drafting, engineering? Do you know aircraft structures? I said, no. They said, we can't hire you. So I showed them some of my drawings. They said, you're hired. <laughs> so I said, what do you want me to do? Well, just think of new ideas for airplanes. Oh, well, they wrote over the section of the aircraft factory, and I worked on nothing but new ideas. After three weeks, the chief draftsman said to me, you've made more contributions in three weeks than the history of aviation. I want you to meet the chief aerodynamicist. Of course, at that time, I didn't agree with the Bernoulli principle. That means air flowing over the top surface of an aircraft wing travels a greater distance and creates a decreased pressure, and most of the lift, two-thirds, comes to the top of the wing. But in order to deflect air at 200 miles an hour in this direction, you've got to take a down load in the wing. Well, he told the aerodynamicist that I didn't accept the Bernoulli principle. I said, I don't want to talk to you if you don't accept that principle. Well, this was one of the major things that I ran into, that scientists were not infallible. They had opinions, they had egos, just like everybody else. And some scientists were patriotic, some worked on weapons of war. I do not consider them scientists. A scientist is one who cannot be trained in one area, optics, engineering, structures, a scientist, one that has curiosity about our social system, poverty, hunger, international affairs. That was a scientist. And it is not that I wanted scientists to control anything. I just wanted them to use the scientific method, that is to measure things before they arrive at conclusions. One thing that was fairly good about science at the time was I learned how to say, I don't know. So when the government said to science, can you put a man on the moon? They said, we don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Well, we don't know what a human being can stand. So they put him in a centrifuge and whirled the person around. And when he conked out, they said they can only stand seven gravity or nine Gs nine times gravity, and they come out. Then they said, we don't know whether people can eat in space. And they found out that if you had a glass of water, if you pulled the glass away fast, the water remained where it was at. And uh, the water would then form bubbles and move to a spaceship, so they had to put water in the container and squeeze it into the mouth to save with food. So that's what I mean by I don't know. A scientist is a person who looks at the situation and says, gee, I, I don't know what caused that. But there's some scientists are jerks, 
and the event words like the bird and the fish goes back to the sporting grounds instinctively. Now what does that mean? They could have said they do it by hula hula. <laughs> because it doesn't tell you anything, the word instinct. And another scientist, named Jock Loeb, said, I want to know what the mechanism is that enables fish to travel thousands of miles as a sporting ground. Don't give me a word like instinct. Tell me how that works. And it was guys like Jock Loeb and wonderful books that were available at the time that helped me escape from the patterns of most people. And I can't go into detail now, but that should suffice for giving me a somewhat different point of view. What is the closest thing you've ever seen to a resource-based economy in your life? I understand you lived on an island for a while. Yes. I, I wanted to know what people would be like if they were not influenced by our social institutions. So I worked my way on a boat to Tahiti. But the Chinese already owned the stores there, and it was kind of a business world. So I found some out islands about 300 miles east of Tahiti. I think it was called Tuamotu. And when I got there, all the natives walked around completely nude. And I never saw a male stare at a female body, because they were swimming nude ever since they were children. So they always looked at the eyes of a female. But in the States, the camera in a movie moves in on the cleavage line. When a girl crosses her legs, the camera covers that. When she walked, it's on her rear end. That's where men get that from. They're not born that way. Women think, well, that's how men are. That's not how they are. That's how they're made by this society. Another interesting thing about the island people is that I brought mirrors and beads and I was going to give them out to establish rapport or a sense of well-being with the natives. But they were already in my hut giving out my mirrors and beads. And I said, you know, what's going on? They said, you got too many of them. <laughs> well, I didn't know what that meant until three days later when some men were pulling fish in with a net and they threw fish to anyone standing there. That was a resource-based economy. They didn't say, you owe me five bucks, you owe me three bucks. They shared everything they had. Then the missionaries came. <laughs> they set up a tent, and they were going to teach them about Jesus. <laughs> so the natives, native women came to church, you know, with their breasts pointing to the moon. <laughs> The missionaries couldn't give the eye on the text. <laughs> so they, they gave the girls t-shirts. They said, when you come to church, you put on a t-shirt. And all the girls put on t-shirts, but they cut two holes. <laughs> I had no idea why, because they were brought up in that area. Now, you couldn't sell a nude magazine to any natives, and they wouldn't collect pictures of nude women, because they didn't know what that meant. If you come to a girl's nose and you say to a guy, did you ever see a girl's nose? No. Well, show him a little bit, he's going to have to loosen his collar. If you bring him up to that. So our culture is warped. You know, I've been to hundreds of restrooms and I've never found a place to rest. <laughs>
and communism were, was for the labor class, and a resource-based economy is very much for the labor class. We want to eliminate it as quickly as possible. We want to do away with boring and monotonous jobs. So it's very different. Yeah. It's not like any system that's gone before. I know. Now here's a more complex question. I think for both of you, I'm going to ask you first. How do you see the transition occurring from our current system to a new system? We're in the process of the transition now. The system is breaking down all over the world. People are losing faith in their elected leaders. So the transition will be painful. And there'll be crime, mass riots, and making of new laws so that the minorities are in the house by nine o'clock and not supposed to be walking around the streets. You can have nothing but trouble ahead in the transition. I have nothing to do with that. Sure. If, people <laughs> if people understand what a resource-based economy can be, I don't know what it will be. That's up to you. Roxanne and I have absolutely no power. If you like the basic idea of a resource-based economy, it's not perfect. It's just a lot better than what we've got now. So it's really up to you, talking to people, telling them about a resource-based economy. Right. That's the only way to bring it about. Right. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Cities like this, we can design a world like this. 
and honestly tell them that we don't have much of a choice if we're going to if we're going to survive on this planet. Because as far as I can see, I haven't yet to see anything that comes close to the sheer logic, humanity, and simplicity and intelligence of what Jacques has been working on his whole life. And I, I want to make that very clear because I, I mean, this isn't just Jacques' ideas. This is just something that is that is. I, I, I don't like using the word empirical or anything like that, but it's near empirical. It makes so much fundamental sense. The world is not going to change with our current competitive mentality. We have to surpass that and create the whole planet as one organism and one home for all of us. So. I'm sorry, throw that out there. If you have ideas about land, I would, you know, we would still live in a monetary system, unfortunately. If there was a big pool of people that had the money to do so, to buy a one mile radius of land to begin this project on a larger scale. They already have where they live in Venice, Florida, similar setup to this, but the circular arrangement shown and made available for the world to see would be a profound step in this. So, there's one thing I always thought was fascinating when I, when I talked to you, Jacques. And you mentioned you used to help juvenile delinquents and alcoholics. And you had a comment where you said, for every alcoholic you save, society produced 10 more. A <laughs> hundred more. <coughs> Come on. The, the system is bigger than one person being able to work on people. Well, I work on alcoholics, drug addicts, people who want to take their lives. And uh, they came to me and they formed very large lines. And I figured, gee, I'd like to address the American Psychological Association and tell them about a new method of getting to people. So when I got in touch with Dr. Kaplan at the University of Miami, he brought it up and they turned me down because I'm not a student of psychology. <laughs> and when you slam the gates on outside ideas without investigating, you're doing the same thing that was done in Nazi Germany. In other words, all ideas should be submitted and evaluated. Because remember, Edison was a nothing. Louis Pasteur was not a doctor, he was a chemist. And the Wright brothers were bicycle mechanics. The experts used to write articles on why man can't fly. Apparently the Wright brothers never read that. So they went ahead and they built a flying machine. Good. Jumping the uh, points here, and Roxanne, I'll address this to you. People, have, I think I've, I've, because of the association you guys have with me, I get a lot of heat from the religious community because of my criticisms toward history of religion and comparative religions and a general kind of a feeling on religion as being separate, a separating mechanism in society. People often have attributed this, and whether it was because of me, I'm not sure, but maybe it happened before, they say, oh, there's no religion in Jock Fresco's vision. You know, what is the place of religion in a resource-based economy? the direction of the Venus Project, and they think that all of their religious aspirations will be fulfilled within the Venus Project society, but here on Earth. So, um, but in the future, we feel that we will teach children how they relate to the, to the world and how they relate to one another, and the most up-to-date findings in science and technology, which will give them better tools to examine their own lives and make a better future for everyone. Right, absolutely. I, I would have to add to that that I believe the superstitious mentality that is so dominant, it's mainly just because of the lack of education. People haven't been told what, has, what we've come to understand, and it's not that religion is a bad thing, it's that it served a point at a certain point in time, and now time has moved forward. All of our knowledge, as I stated in the presentation, is emerging. And I just hope anyone that's out there that's religiously oriented that might be opposed to anything would keep that in mind. And really, the doctrines of what you guys talk about are everything that all of the great religions have ever talked about. The world working together, humans seeing each other as their own. And I find it very difficult for any religious person to, you know, just get, you know, it understands the, the peace intents, obviously, negative attributes. <coughs> I think it's very powerful uh, for the religious people. I think it's very powerful 
that what you're doing is actually putting it into focus and putting it into practice. What the great philosophers and the religious, religious teachers have been saying since uh, since antiquity. So. This is for both of you. It's kind of a broad question. You know, you talk about prefabricated quest, prefabricated homes, and people automatically think, you know, trailer parks, and they think, you know, everyone will be the same. Everyone will be regimented. What is this uh, fear of this loss of individuality? Well, first of all, you don't have individuality. That's a myth. If you had individuality, it couldn't be wars. There'd be thousands of different political parties, not just the Democrats and Republicans. And you've never had a democratic society. Well, that's an illusion. So what we hope to do and what we hope to accomplish is to expand every human being to their highest potential. This would be a sane society. Yes. But people would be alike in a lot of different ways. They, have, they care about one another. And, and the environment, and they, they wouldn't be able to put up with the idea of war hurting one another in, in any way. And they would have allegiance to the earth and everyone on it, as Doc was talking about. They have that type of identity. They have more understanding about cultural differences and what were the conditions in the culture that made people different, different, have different behaviors. So they have a better understanding of semantics and they would not have that much violent behavior because they understand why people behave differently. So it's it's not bad to be alike in certain ways, but in saner ways. Yeah, I like the Carl Sagan quote from one of his writings where he says, if we were visited by extraterrestrials, the differences we have would be trivial compared to the similarities and the requirements that we all need and, and everything. And I think it's uh, the materialism in our system is and the need for money and this, this cutthroat mentality has really caused so many problems psychologically that, that people shouldn't fear being the same and people shouldn't care what they wear in the individual. You know, it, this, is a, this is a distortion that's been created, I think. It's a ploy to sell more garments. Right, it's like, like <laughs> earrings, you know. Like Jacques, you commented on earrings. Remember, what, what's the point of an earring? Remember what you said about that? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and blind people had what looked like a hearing aid that generated a sound like a bat can fly in the dark and not hit things. So if blind people had an acoustical device, they can sense a table in front of them, an open door by feedback of sound. And this is what we've been working on. In the future, People think, well, if machines do most things, most jobs, what will people do? There are things we know nothing about. Why the degenerative diseases of the retina occurs? We don't know how to stop heart attacks today. There's so much we don't know. That's what people will be working on. Right. They won't be killing one another. They'll be working on problems common to all people. Yeah. To zombies, hurricanes, all that area. Not killing one another. Here's a technical question. Uh, it's, by 2050, it's claimed that there will be over 10 billion people on the planet. Do you think by our current methods today that we will be able to deal with that type of population? Well, we have the methods, but we don't apply them. But I mean, these today, what we're doing right now in the monetary system, do you no. think that this population growth will be extremely detrimental? Yes, yes, I do. I think so, too. I think that in the future, with a better and more relevant education, people will study what the carrying capacity of the Earth is and the environment and maintain a population in accordance with the carrying capacity of the Earth, not someone's opinion. If the Vatican said, go forth and multiply, and the Lord will provide, all I would say to the Vatican, if he doesn't provide, with you. <laughs> so, Roxanne, now, 
Here's a big question. Will those in positions of differential advantage right now try to prevent the development of a resource-based economy? Yeah. The industrious, the industrialists, the lobbyists, the banking institutions? Yeah, they certainly will. Yeah. If, if we get more well-known and more support and more people working towards this direction, you'll hear all sorts of misinformation about us out there. And uh, it, it will be a threat. That's happened all through history. But, you know, with its own weight, the, um, the free enterprise system, as they automate more, and they have to, to become competitive, more and more people, as PJ presented very well, will be out of work. So they'll lose the ability to produce, to, to, to purchase the goods and services turned out. That's the end of the free enterprise system. You know, I liken it to a cancer on a cat. It eventually kills its host, so it's really not very bright. That's what's happening with the system. Yeah, yeah. And what about um, those in those corrupt powers that everyone talks about? How is it? How is it that people aren't just going to get corrupt and start having genocides in your new system? You know, people always comment on that. Well, during the transition, you're going to have all those problems. Once we get the cities built and move toward a resource-based economy. We will deal with the problems that produce human aberrant behavior. Right. Get rid of those conditions. There's an old saying that uh, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's why we have no humans in government, yeah. only machines. Humans have loused up everything they've ever tried. Communism, socialism, free enterprise, they've always loused things up. And they try to turn people against machines. Don't forget, guided missiles are guided by people. And when people drop bombs over cities, it isn't machines dropping bombs over cities. People contaminate the ocean, the atmosphere for profit. It's people that have loudest up the world, not machines. Yeah, good point. <laughs> Now, people will say that you're providing all of these technical ideas, but what about the spiritual, as people always talk about, these notions of metaphysics and the, uh, the out there, the, the everything else? Yeah. Well, that's because people really don't know how all this began. Where did it come from? Somebody had to make it, and this is where they began to make God in their own image. A guy that sits up there in the clouds, and he looks down at everybody. And if they don't behave, he creates floods and earthquakes and disease. And if you don't follow the Ten Commandments, you burn eternally. That sounds more like a psychopath than God. <laughs> the Eskimos concept of God living in a big igloo, and there's lots of seals around. The American Indians call heaven the happy hunting grounds. You know, lots of animals, lots of bow and arrows, and you get all the animals you need. So people try to conceive of God in their own concept. That's why I try to tell you over and over again, there's no such thing as good or bad people. In ancient Rome, they used to feed Christians the lions. This was typical. And when a Roman family came to see the Christians being fed the lions, the kids would say, Daddy, can we come next week to see Christians being fed the lions? And Daddy said, only if you behave yourself. <laughs> Is there anything wrong with these kids? No. There's something aberrant about the social institution that advocates that. And it's now 10 o'clock, and I was hoping that we get the Q&A faster than this, but let's do the Q&A with all of you now. Please uh, speak up, Ms. Thank you, Jacques. <laughs> thank you, Roxanne. He says thank you. <laughs> My question is, the, um, Jacques and Roxanne, what do you see in the future in terms of interpersonal and emotional intelligence, um, gender roles? What do you see? How, where, where is that going? What are your feelings on gender roles in, in, in the future? Well, I think it would be, oh, again, I'm just, you asked me that, so I'm going to tell you, when you give a little girl a doll, you're programming her. 
let the girl pick what she wants, whether it's a director's set or electric trains, don't start handing them or tying a big bow in their hair. Then you're producing an object like yourself. I have a couple of questions, but I'll keep this brief. I think the most um, pressing thing, or to me it would be, uh, what happens when a machine decides that it's more efficient for a family member to no longer live if that was, I know it seems crazy, but what happens if that were the case, if it was more efficient for them to not be part of that society? Would you stand idly by and let that You mean take a machine place? decides someone should die? Yes. I mean, um, if someone were to die, well, I think his question is, is um, if, if a machine logically decided that someone should die, what's your response to that? Well, I would respond in the way that machines don't have attitudes. They don't have ambition. If you took your laptop and smashed it in the front of 50 other computers, <laughs> They don't care. Machines have no ambition. They don't want to control people. This is a human projection into machines. That comes from Hollywood. Now, I'd like to add that, that you know, in, in this system, humans are understood as cultural products. So everyone has a certain degree. And by the way, once we get past our current system, all of the ridiculously despotic behavior that's constantly created, you're going to see an entirely new world of people that really don't just, out of no reason, go and just stab someone to death. Everyone has a reason. So for the machine to decide you know, that this person's a threat, which I think is what your question was, that really wouldn't, that, that's not really a relevant question. It doesn't have a real basis. If anyone does kill someone out of jealousy and old time mentalities, you know, derived from earlier elements and probably the transition, you know, as we move towards a different society, I think um, they would be treated as what they really are, it's a sick patient as a presumption in the end. Thank you all for what you're doing. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your question. We're going to lay them back here. Hello. Um, I have a question about your thoughts about culture and history and how that plays out in, in uh, in this, uh, in this new construct. Um, and, and, and specifically, I think what, there's this kind of maybe egoic thought of attachment to the past or to, to history or to culture. And so how does that play out in this new model, this new system? Yeah, um, traditions, well, a lot of, a lot of old traditions really long outlived their usefulness today. I know when um, there was an old Jewish man who came up and said, are you going to allow traditions in, in a resource-based economy? And we said, um, well, the Jew. And he said, yes. And we said, how about the clan? They had been meeting 70 years in the same place. And he said, no, 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 not that tradition. So we really have to see what traditions are useful to society and perpetuate those. Those that are harmful, we really need to outgrow them. There's no restriction. There's no restriction. It's, it's a matter of education. You know, the, the attachments that we all have are very much material. I believe and they're very much created by our system because of the materialistic attachment itself that's perpetuated by our social system. I, I would love, personally, I, I can't stand property. I can't stand uh, ornaments, I can't stand any of that stuff anymore. I've come to realize that it doesn't mean anything. It's like if you're attached to earrings and you're on an island and there's no one else there, would you wear the earrings? Because you need no one there. You know, it's, a trans it's a big step, I think, uh, for people to think that way. Um, but it's a good question. Emil? Basically, I see your guys' point of view is purely scientific. I don't see any holisticness to it. So I'm going to try to make an analogy in terms of science. Um, I like to think of the world as a big biome, it's just one organism, we're all in balance, the ecosystem, and <clears throat> within that, I think that if we push too far in one direction, that it's going to equal drastic outcome, you know what I mean? Like if we took one species out, one species is going to deplete and the other one's going to go through the roof. 
And in, in my eyes, I, I'm trying to just think of the whole table rather than just the solution, is that if we push too far for the solution, we get everything that we need to support everyone. Is the equal and opposite reaction going to happen, do you think? Well, I think the whole thing is a holistic concept. I think it would, I would say it's what you're talking about. It's a, it might be scientific, but scientific isn't a cold, singular approach. It really is the approach of everything in a lot of ways. I mean, we can debate metaphysics and debate a lot of other you know, seemingly esoteric topics, but I think the holistic concept that you just mentioned is completely built into this. I, um, I, other than that, I'm not quite sure what else uh, I mean, there's no species that are removed. The whole idea is to make the world as natural as possible, to make the world as simple as possible. No more political strife and the nonsensical inventions, materialism, and all the greed and nonsense, and all the confusion and noise that goes on in our minds. We're reducing society to an extent while simultaneously opening it up tremendously for extended human potential. It's a humanist idea, not humanist in a classical definition, but it's humanist in its very approach. You know, that's, it's, we're not gonna save all the species of the world. We're gonna do everything we can diligently to make our lives as best as we can while having respect for the similarity relationship with life holistically, which entails the fact that we have to take care of it. We have to take care of it. We have to take care of the bees, which are disappearing still. We have to take care of everything. So I, I hope that answers your general question. Uh, where would the ideal location to start the Society of the Project be, meaning that America is going to be really dangerous and really unlivable when this monetary system fails? Like, I know there are countries like New Zealand that have like, really pure water, basically untouched, and then, you know, not at sea level at all. Would that be more ideally? I, I, her, her question is, where is the most ideal place to uh, in, build the first city? Where have you the resources? Where do you think would be the best place to start that? The first country that says, let's build. <laughs> Iceland would be kind of a difficult place, I think, to start because they have geothermal, but they have a very limited amount of resources, so it would be very difficult for me to self-contain. I think we could have a choice as to where to build the first one, and then it's still within the monetary system. Then someplace that's flat, and it's easy to build, and warm, so we can use solar energy, because we, if we still are within the, the monetary system, we'll have limited access to resources and other things. So we have to take all those things into consideration. The, the most abundant area we can find, actually New Zealand is a great, great place. I have some people on, on the site talking about, as I guess, people in New Zealand, and I, I, there's someone eventually that kept emailing me about land they had, and it's something I'm, I need to follow up on. Everyone's very excited about the whole, the whole uh, possibility of all of this, just getting it down and getting a functional operation going. So, are there any like uh, education systems now or are going to be in place soon that are going to try to work on that, like a different form of education, not like the cookie cutter kind of program education system that we have now? I would, I would just first say that uh, education, as I've noted, is created, is focused on the monetary system. John, your feelings on a new educational system, what would the new educational system entail? Well, would not be brought up with fairy tales. Mm. There's so many interesting things in nature, how beavers build dams, continental drift, and children can learn how to read at a very early age. And they can be learned, they can learn to appreciate the, the stars, planetary sciences. You don't have to give them Jack and the Beanstalk. Mm. Life is tough enough without all those myths. various websites that claim to have debunked the zeitgeist, claiming that a lot of them are false representations and such forth, and they've also made claims to uh, compare the Venus Project to something like the New World Order, where uh, secret societies want to create one world, one government, and so forth. Um, what would you say to those folks? Uh, well, first of all, these zeitgeist debunked stuff, uh, all of them are all of them are from the religious community focused on part one of zeitgeist one. 
I've never seen anything other than that. And they just call it Zeitgeist the Bomb. And you have a Christian apologist, and they throw you know, pictures of Alice Jones. And you have, you know, and then there you go. They say it's like that's fun. Well, first of all, the new order aspect, any, any change, as Roxanne Orient said initially, is going to be met with opposition. And we have a very superstitious and brainwashed culture on multiple levels, a very terrifying culture, too. And if you say anything about the world working together, boom, you're Karl Marx, you're communist. And it's just, it's mind blowing to me. As far as the secret society is all that bullshit, all I have to say is, people emailing this crowd and they go straight in bed. I mean, I don't know what to do with it. They're not thinking. I, 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 uh, I, I see the tension that has occurred, and I, I get opposition from all these patriots and all of these people that want to preserve, and they tend to come from the same narrow-viewed, nationalist, religious community, unfortunately. And I, I can't, uh, it's, this is too important, and I basically just ignore those people. I just, Why create another, an artificial world when either by design or by evolution we've gotten already a perfect world without the technology what? on Earth? And a perfect world. How would human reproduction be controlled in this society with abundance? And when did we forget that we were animals? Ah. Well, we never forgot we were animals. This is a totally naturalist system. Uh, the abundance has always been there only at a certain level. I would have to say that our transition point here is to realize that all the work that we want to do, all the labor that we have to do, we used to be hunters and gatherers, we have to spend outrageous amounts of time collecting food. You know, unless we want to go back to that period, which in a lot of ways is, is unique and almost better than what we have now. But we now have the ability to have an incredibly new world, not artificial whatsoever, actually more natural and practical, where people are actually free because of this new creation that we have come up with called technology, I find it to be completely natural, completely evolutionary. I see nothing artificial about it whatsoever. Human reproduction? Human re Educated. Yeah. Human education. Education. We can help population control. We wouldn't force anybody to do anything, but they'd be, have much more knowledge about how we, um, when we deplete our resources, we're really that we're really going to have more violence and war and so what we really want to do is make a, a society that has abundance and that's how you you know you, you say that you're, you're you're talking about a society that's that's natural but we're trying to make a, a, a world that preserves what we have out there what's happening now we're depleting the earth we're killing each other so there's really no way out now what we're going towards is just annihilation. So we're working on a society that helps preserve the earth and one another. And, and people will understand. They will understand what they're doing to the world when they have children. There's, it's no coincidence that the poorest people have the most children. You notice that? And it's, it's because they don't, they don't think about it. And they come from superstitious dispositions, like Jacques pointed out, where be fruitful and multiply. Well, that's, that's great. I mean, that doesn't help anything. Even, you know, with these Supreme Court justices that want to make laws against abortion, well, why don't you just take the babies that are born and stick them on the steps of the Supreme Court and let them take care of them? You know, this is this twisted mentality and superstition that we have that <clears throat> it's going to be difficult to get past, but the direction is there. I think, I think it's just a matter of time that people come to understand the true nature of, of life and how we all have to work together the symbiotic processes of life and the emergent nature of reality, which enables us to constantly change and grow. As I stated, we have to become experts at changing our mind. I think once that value system takes hold, people will really start to change very quickly. Like very, very well, you are an animal, I'm afraid. We are all are animals. We are all products of our system. There's no individuality. I'm not some, you know, I'm not coming to the ether. I'm, I'm a walking culmination of my life experience. I'm an amalgam of my experience. I'm not original. I'm only original in the sense that I happen to have unique experiences that's different, just like all of you do. My creativity is that all of my life experiences have oriented me in a specific, a specific trait of thought. That's what makes me who I am. I'm a product of the environment and intimately connected with everything. I'm not an individual and no one is.
so to say you build this, this city and uh, you prove that it works and you show it to the world leaders, um, which world leader do you expect will give up its power? And I suspect none of them will. So my question is, what will it take for this system practically to actually take hold and this transition to actually happen? Well, welcome to the Zeitgeist Movement. The Zeitgeist Movement is a grassroots, trans grassroots campaign to get all of the nations, as many people as possible, every nation across all borders, into a common focus, moving in one direction to the general welfare of humanity as a whole. Once enough people realize the merits, they've become so distraught and destroyed by this system, they're going to say, you know what, this is ridiculous, what are we doing? And they're going to wake up and they're going to say, you know what, this, this actually makes sense. You know, this, this makes sense, we're going, to, we're going to join. And I expect, you know, we have about a quarter million members right now since October, which is pretty good. If uh, things continue at the rate they're going, by next year this will be in Madison Square Garden next year. begins with pressure against all political systems simultaneously. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to the transition to the current system. What's your opinion on uh, experimental uh, communities, whether it be like the Earthship community from New Mexico, that was mentioned, or uh, Palo Solari's uh, Arco Santi project in Arizona, uh, eco villages, uh, things like that, where, that are breaking the mold, even uh, certain Native American nations that are breaking away and saying that you know, there's a different way of doing things. Uh, what's your opinion on those and as far as creating a network of lives to have those be the icebreakers of uh, the, the times? We feel if they're interested in this direction, then we'd like to work together. But there's a lot of splinter groups that go off and try different things just because they're disillusioned with what's going on today. But they don't have an overall social direction. People in the green movement, or if they want to build a, a nice clean city, or they want to build a green building, that's not going to solve the problem. It's a whole new social movement and a social direction that we need to work towards. I, I would also add that, that the logic of green and, and, uh, and recycling and optimization isn't a stylized concept. It's, it's universal. It's understanding what's relevant to our life. I mean, it, what, you, you probably get a lot of emails from people that have, ooh, we have this new floating island that we think is great for Jacques Fresco. I mean, uh, what makes your system as an, what makes your system better, or what is the train of thought that is important in your system that makes it near universal in your mind? It's not patchwork. It's not patchwork. And it's the ability of, they have what they call today, intelligence test. Actually, the only intelligence test is your ability to extract significance from any situation. That's intelligence. But other definitions don't make sense. An intelligent electrical engineer of 75 years ago couldn't get a job today. So what does that mean? That there's no such thing as intelligence. It's an ongoing process. There's no such thing as civilization yet. We learn more every year and add to it. There are no final frontiers yet. No utopians. No best computer. That's the best we can do up to now with what we know. Well, my question is, um, if you all have experience, uh, what do you think might be um, in the future uh, ramifications and potential of a society that has a much greater awareness of the evidence of access to metaphysical dimensions through the use of a genetic catalog? Primarily uh, diet methyltryptamine, DMT, and psilocybin, wow, along with the practice of uh, shamanism. I think um, I'll answer this one. I think that <laughs> first of all, I think we should look at it differently. I think um, I think there is a general perception of mind that that if people experiment with certain things and expands their awareness in some way and it opens up different parameters of mind. And that is, that is a personal choice. In this system, there's, there's no restriction on anything. There's certainly no law against drugs. People will be educated to understand. I mean, if you decriminalize drugs right now in America, you'd see a dramatic improvement in about five years. As far as 
metaphysical notion that you talk about, I don't, I don't, I really couldn't say I can relate to that. Um, I think interesting ideas, but when it comes to the tangibility of the basic necessities of life, what we're talking about is is getting the foundation done, and then we'll have time to talk about metaphysics and things like that. Well, I, mean, it's a matter I mean, it's a matter of what I was kind of asking is, is your opinion on, on what you can speculate can be uh, the potential and, and also the changes and ramifications of the awareness brought to more people that if you are curious to actually see evidential proof of magic and metaphysics within your life, it is accessible to you. Alright, I'm going to let John go trust magic and metaphysics, so you're not going to like it. Of metaphysics and seances and magic and things like that. Well, I was told by two Catholic priests that there are things beyond the physical. So I said, I have never seen that. Take me there when it occurs, or let me know when I 